Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do the Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Scott. And I'm Jasmine. For math homework help, call in Bakersfield 636-4357. Everywhere else, 1-866-636-6284. Email math at kern.org. We're online at dothemathonline.net. And on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done, Jasmine. So where do you attend school and what year or grade are you in? I'm in ninth grade and I attend Independence High School. So you're a Falcon? Yeah. You digging it down there? Mm-hmm. Good. So what kinds of things have you gotten involved with at school at Independence? Uh, we have the Energy Academy program, and I'm the freshman representative. Oh, good. I'm in United Nations, and I'm also in Energy Academy, which puts me into, like, two or three math grades higher. Right, I was going to say, because that's one of the unique things about Independence High School is that academy, and I know a lot of students have benefited from going through that academy and you as a freshman right now and especially being the representative are going to gain a lot of knowledge mm -hmm. and uh, very good things going through that academy right there so what made you go towards that uh, i have a cousin who's in there and when she explained to me what it was and when i found out like a lot of all in math like i'm like i don't know how to explain it but in math like it's really just comes to me easily okay. so when i heard about their math program i wanted to be in it because it also will help me in the future when I go to college. Why do you think math comes to you easily? The tricks I've learned when I was little from my parents, it just helps me do the mental math a bit more quickly. Do you think they're tricks? They're tricks to me, yeah. Tricks to you, okay. How about we say they're another way to do them? Maybe an easier way to do them, another way to do them? Because, and if you want to call them tricks, that's fine, because I know that we're, a lot of people are like, yeah, there's a little math trick that you can do. There could be other right? ways too. Yeah. So and I'm, I'm glad that you're open to exploring different ways to do mathematics, right? Because a lot of people are like, well, you know, that's, that, there's one way that we need to do this, right? But if mm -hmm. your parents are able to show you another way to do something and it clicks with you, that's the key right there, all right? So do you have uh, brothers and sisters yourself? Yeah, I have one brother. Okay, and do you help him with his homework or does he help you or? No, I help him a lot. You help him a lot? Well, that's good. Well, see, that's why you're even better at math because <laughs> you're helping somebody else with their math, right? Mm-hmm. You can help me with some math right now? Yep. All right, we have our social media problem of the day. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. So it says, what is the sum? We have 10 squared plus 10 cubed. So what do you think of when you see that? Obviously, you've worked with exponents before. All right, so what do we need to do? What do you, so, because there's a lot of students looking at that going, I don't see 20 anywhere because they're probably thinking 10 plus 10 and yeah. not knowing what the exponents are. But explain to me uh, how to easily solve this problem. I see there's two common bases, 10. Okay. So that I know if there's a common base and they're added, you add the exponents. So what I would do is keep the 10 there and I did 2 plus 3, which is 5. Okay, so based on that, what do you think the answer would be? B. So you think it would be? There's a lot of people that said B and they're doing exactly what you did. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is 10 squared? A hundred. Okay. And what is 10 cubed? A thousand. So what's a hundred plus a thousand? 10,000. I have 100. 100. And I have a thousand. A thousand, one thousand, one hundred. <laughs> okay. So we've done things two different ways here now, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's take a look at it again. So 10 squared plus 10 cubed. And you automatically said 10 to the fifth, which a lot of people, trust me, a lot of people on social media have done the same thing. But then when we actually just take it piece by piece and say it, right, we say 100 plus 1,000, we come up with a different answer, don't we? Yeah. So what do you think the answer is? A. You're sure? 
Wait, <laughs> one second, Mr. Cushion. We got her thinking today. All right, now you don't want to go with D because I'm like, there is a 20 there. But it's not the 20. Okay, so we're, we're eliminating D. We're eliminating D. All right, and why can we eliminate C? Because it's not 100, because if you do 10 squared, that's 100. And we're not even considering we're the 10 a, cubed, so yeah, that's out. So that's C and D out. are gone. So now you're a little uh, conundrum, A or B. Which one is it? I'm going with B. So you're going to go with B because that was your gut instinct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm telling you right now that we just spoke about it and I told you that this is 100 plus 1,000 and you said it's 1,100. You got me thinking. That's what I want you to do. That's all I want you to do. I want you thinking. I'm going with my gut instinct. All right. I'm, I'm going, going to let you go with it. I'm not going to push you anymore, sister. All right. So you're going to go with B. Let's see what the answer is. Ooh. <laughs> 1,100. Now, it's always good to go with your gut. And you got to go, you know what? The old man is sitting here telling me that it's this <laughs> plus this. I went with my gut. Sophia Sophia is just cracking up over there about that right there. So, but does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. All right, good. So, what is the course that you're in right now? Algebra 2. Okay, and we're going to do some of your homework in a little bit. But first, we're going to take a look at today's Math in the News. All right, today's Math in the News. Um, you know of this uh, corporation Disney. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with them? Yep. Have you ever been to any Disney park? Do you know which one you've been to? The one near us is uh, in Orange County, I believe. Yeah, in Anaheim, right? Anaheim, That's Disneyland, I believe. All right, am I correct on that? That's Disneyland. Yes. All right, which a lot of us have probably been to Disneyland in California. But in Florida, it's Disney World. Were you aware that there were two different ones? Yeah. Okay. So Disney World ticket prices over the years. Do, do you have any idea what it costs to get into Disney right now? I mean, Disneyland and Disney World are, are different things, but I'm assuming that their prices are probably around the same. Two fifty. Two fifty. All right. Well, let's find out what's going on. All right. Do you know when Disneyland opened or Disney World opened? Because Disney World opened before Disneyland. So Disney World opened in 1971. It was $3.50 to get in. Now, that's a long time ago, right? It's 50 years ago, all right? But if you wanted to go on a ride, most of them you had to pay extra other than the $3.50. So the $3.50 got you into the place. You could look around, and you could have a lot of fun on that, right? Adjusting for inflation, that would be $26 today, accounting for inflation, all right? When do you, do you remember when you went to Disneyland? I went back. I went this or oh, last so year. Oh, you went in May. really recent. recently, yeah. Okay, so was there a special occasion you went for? It was for my orchestra trip. Oh, awesome! So that's another reason to be in band or orchestra, right? Because you guys get to go to a lot of uh, field trips and stuff like that. Yep. So you got to perform there also. Mm -hmm. You go down Main Street and play? No, we sat. We went to actually this year. We went to the California Adventure and we performed. Okay. But usually we end up going to Disneyland. All right, and you guys are in one place playing? Yeah. Okay, so it's not a marching band thing. No, no, no. All right. So in the 1980s, the price went up to $8 from $3.50. And the rides are still a little bit extra. You can see inflation went up. Then, only two years later, the price just about doubles within two years. And there was a little thing called Reaganomics going on in the 1980s. You familiar with that? Kind of. Ah, it's all right. We'll keep on moving on. <laughs> all right. So in the 1990s. So the ticket goes up about 20 bucks, right? It goes up to 35 bucks. You can see the inflated price right there. 1998, up a little bit more. 2000s, all right? So now we're getting into close to when you're being born pretty soon, right? So the ticket is 50 bucks. A couple of years later, it goes up 50%, right? That's a big jump. You go up 50% in price, right? Mm -hmm. So now it's a 75 bucks. So now this is probably when you're going to be alive, right? If you wanted to go, your little tiny kid, $89, all right? $99 for Magic Kingdom, but 94 for others. And I was told that there are other places you can go besides the Magic Kingdom, which is why there's a difference in price. Much like Disneyland and what was the other one you went to? California Dis Adventure. Okay, so California Adventure. So much like those two are a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? So if you want to pay for one, you get in one, but it might be different for the other one. I don't know. So 2020. So now it's 109 to 159, right? So we can see the inflation right there. So now, 2024, it's $164 to $189 for the Magic Kingdom. 
Now, that's the one in Florida. Now, we know that everything in California costs more, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm sure that Disneyland probably might cost a little bit more, but I would say that it's probably around the same price. I would say if it's under $200, it's comparable, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. All right. So I want to know if you had heard about this story about this guy, Matthew, who had an old ticket to Disney World. Did you hear about this in the news? No. All right, so anyway, this guy found a ticket from 1978. And you can see the yellow ticket right in the middle there on that second screen. There are no expiration dates on the Disney World tickets at that point. And I don't even know if there are now. There might be now. But this guy bought it in 1978. And it was purchased for $8. That's cheap. So he just went, like recently, and got in using that ticket. Because he said, I've got a ticket to Disney World. And they're like, let's take a look at your ticket, right? And they're like, well, I don't, you know, they probably <laughs> were like, we have never seen anything like this before, right? And he was able to get in on that $8 ticket. So that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Because mm. especially now, if it's close to $200, you're getting in with a ticket that you've found. I doubt the guy's been holding it going, I'm going to wait for the one day that I you know, want to go and do this. But I'm sure he found it. And uh, so we can see right now that $8 ticket, inflation would have been 31 So he saved $133, basically, by holding on to that ticket for so long. Not a bad deal, is it? Nope. All right. Well, that is today's Math in the News. So did you have a favorite part of uh, Disneyland when you went? Like, is there a certain attraction or anything that you like to go to? It's between Small World and the Teacups. Isn't the Teacups part of Small World? Or is Small World a big thing and Teacups is in it? I or explain that to me. I thought Small World was part of, like, the you go inside the castle, kind of. Okay. And there's like, a little ride that goes toward inside the castle, you come out, and then you go back in. Oh, and Fantasyland, I'm hearing, mm -hmm. is where the teacups are. Yeah, I, I believe so. Okay, and Small World is something where you take a ride and you see the different countries? Mm hmm Okay, so now it's coming back. This has been a long time since I've been mm -hmm. there. So you like the teacups and you like, it's a Small mm -hmm. World. Were there any rides there that you, because I know like at Six Flags, there are roller coasters. You a big roller coaster fan, like those kinds of roller coasters? where it's a near-death experience? <laughs> so it depends on what kind of it is. If it's like all the way up and you just drop down quickly, then no. But if it's like you stay and you kind of linger for a little bit, then you go down. All right, but you don't like that sharp 90 no, degree drop. No, not the sharp 90 degree All right, well, you ready to get to work? Yep. All right, get on over to the board right now. We're gonna have you and Scott work on some of your homework. So imaginary, imaginary land. Imaginary right? land. Fantasy land, all this kind of stuff, which is what you're dealing with. And we want to know what those are first. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because probably a lot of our viewers don't even know what imaginary numbers are. They've seen like a 6X or a 5Y, and in these problems we're going to have something like a 5I or a 6I, right? And some mm -hmm. students might think, well, that's just a number next to a letter or a number next to a variable, but it's a little different, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us what you know about I, about imaginary numbers. What I know is I is, I is either, well, it's both the square root of negative one or i squared, which is also a negative one. Gotcha. So it's kind of strange in math, which we like to think of as black and white, one way or the other, right? We have numbers that we have created for very specific purposes. So you can take the square root of one, which is one, but taking the square root of negative one Leads you to getting at I. some point was impossible. Mm -hmm. And so someone said, let's make up a number so that we can actually have an answer to this problem. And that number, or represented by the I, is I. And I'm glad you brought that up because there are a lot of students going, well, yeah, it could just be a regular variable like N or X. Right. Right. And we have some problems on the other side of your homework I saw that deal with that mm -hmm. at a different level. But let's take a look at number one right now. So open up some parentheses. We have negative 6 plus 2I, close parentheses, plus open parentheses, 5 minus 3I, close parentheses. Okay, so the good thing is, in this situation, as you probably know, you can treat the I just like a variable, right? So mm -hmm. you're gonna put things together that go together. What would you do if you were gonna chart this problem? Since it's read both I and the both parentheses, I'd first see if any of the negative or positives change. Okay, do they change? Yes. Okay, show me. So then this would stay the same, mm -hmm. negative six plus two I. But it's a positive times a positive, but the five stays as a positive five. Okay, good. 
but then the positive and the negative would change to a negative. Uh -huh. So it actually stays the same. Right. It's kind of so like taking good. those parentheses off, but that's exactly what you want to do first because you want to take those parentheses off so you can put things together. Good job. That's a great first step. It's exactly what I would do. What would you do next? Combine like terms. Okay, let's do it. I see there's like terms of negative 6 and 5. They have no variable after it. Right. So negative 6 plus 5 is negative 1. Okay. But what you remember is when you do the answer, I always remember this before I write my I, is that the real numbers goes in the front. Ah, so I okay. make sure I do that first before I do anything else. And I like that you said that too, because normally when we have a variable in an, in an equation or in an expression, we'll have like maybe 6x plus 5 or something like that. Usually we put the variable first, mm -hmm. but this is not a variable, right? We're going to treat it like a variable for purposes of simplifying, but it's not truly a variable. I does not represent some unknown number. We know what I is. Mm -hmm. I is the square root of negative 1 which sounds strange, but I really like that you said that. We are going to put the i last in this expression. Good job. Okay, so let's combine those i's. So positive 2i minus 3i would equal to negative i. Good. And you could put a 1 in front of that as well, right? Mm -hmm. You could if you want to. Yeah, negative 1i. So looking at your chart up here, can you change this i to anything else to make it more simple? Because we know no. if it was i squared, we could change it to a, a negative 1, right? That'd be nice. But we still have i, we still which have is i. i to the first power, which That's is right. i. So, you so we're going to keep that chart over there today while we do some of these problems with imaginary numbers. And if you can, at the end of simplifying an expression, if you can make it more simple and get rid of i's, because we love to have answers that don't have imaginary parts to them, then we'd like to do that. But in this case, that's exactly the end of the problem. Good job. What do you think we should do next? Well, let's do the next one. Let's go down to number three. <laughs> so we have open parentheses, okay. 2 minus 8i, close parentheses, minus open parentheses, 9 minus 4i, close parentheses. Okay. So my eyes look like backwards J's, but that's just so you don't get them, get them confused, okay? Okay. <laughs> so we want to probably do the same thing you did last time, which is get rid of those parentheses. Small change here. Let's see what you do. This stays the same. Yeah, it does. So it's still 2 minus 8i. Yeah. This time I see there's two negatives, but first I would look at the 9, it's a positive. So a negative times a positive is a negative, so Good. this would change into a minus 9. Good job. And then a negative times a negative is a positive, so instead of negative 4i, this would be plus 4i. Good. And now we have an expression with no more parentheses, and now you can start combining things together. Numbers first, right? <laughs> 2 minus 9 is negative 7. And negative 8i plus 4i is negative 4i. Oh, man. Awesome. One more time, let's look at the chart real quick. Can you change this at all? Can the i go away? Can you make it vanish and actually have a real number? No. Nope. No, we're still imaginary, right? What is it called when you have a constant like this and an i at the end? You know what that's called? Not the top Confusing? Of my head. Frustrating? <laughs> <laughs> really, really fun? <laughs> we, we have an imaginary expression, is what we have here. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, it'd be interesting to see kind of what happens once we start getting into the other eyes with some exponents, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And we'll take care of some of those a little bit later on. But for your great work so far today, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Grillin' Burger. So congratulations on that. And uh, you know what? You were dealing with some nice math under pressure right there. <laughs> Did you feel under pressure? A little bit. All right. That's good. Well, a little bit of pressure. So there's nothing wrong with that. Right now, we're going to check out even more math under pressure. Hey guys, it's John, and we're back at the Do The Math Hot Rod Garage, where today we're talking about math under pressure, oil pressure. Motor oil is the lifeblood of the engine in our dragster. In order for our car to go from zero to 190 miles an hour in seven seconds down the quarter mile, there's a ton of internal stress going on on the components of our engine. The crankshaft, the connecting rods, the pistons are all turning under tremendous pressure. A thin film of oil, only a few thousandths of an inch thick, is all that protects those metal components from rubbing one on the other. But without the oil in place, it would wreck our motor in just a couple of seconds. It cost us the race and probably thousands of dollars in repair. Ensuring that our engine has oil pressure throughout the race is one of the most important things our driver has to keep his eye on. Here's how it works. The oil pan of our engine contains 10 quarts of racing oil. 
Immersed in that oil is our oil pump. It's a mechanical pump that pulls that oil in, pressurizes it, and then sends it throughout our engine. Passages in our engine deliver that oil to those friction points to ensure that it's got that cushion of lubrication every place it needs it. The faster our engine spins, the faster the oil pump turns, the higher the pressure and the greater the volume of oil that's circulating through our engine. We monitor that critical oil pressure with the simple mechanical oil pressure gauge. It's fed a direct stream of oil, just like the rest of the engine components, directly from the oil pump right here. It registers in pounds per square inch, and it's at 10 pound intervals that it's noted here on the gauge. A good rule of thumb for our engine is 10 pounds of oil pressure for every 1,000 RPM that our engine is seeing. So if we go through the finish line at 8,000 RPM, we're gonna feel pretty safe seeing about 80 pounds of pressure on this gauge. We always like to warm up our car before we make a pass down the quarter mile. That lets us get all the critical components in the engine, the transmission, and the rear differential up to speed. It assures that that critical oil is circulating everywhere and all the parts and pieces are up to temperature. Our engine's gonna make a lot more horsepower when everything's operating at the proper temperature. Now, it's been a couple of months since we've started our engine, so before we just go and start it up, we're gonna turn it over to build up that oil pressure. We've taken the spark plugs out so it'll turn over a little easier. We're not starting it at this point, we're just looking to spin that motor over pull that oil up into the oil pump and throughout the critical components of our engine. I'll be watching the oil pressure gauge. It might take a couple of seconds for it to register, but once it does, we know we've got oil circulated through our engine and we're ready to start our engine. Okay, we're ready to warm up our engine. We've seen that oil pressure exists when we spun our engine up, and now we're ready to start it. When Crew Chief Billy starts our engine, I'm gonna have my eye on that oil pressure gauge to make sure there's no weird fluctuations. After he removes the starter, he's gonna be checking for leaks, checking the timing, and then monitoring the temperature for our engine with an infrared temperature gauge. Okay, here we go. Well, there you have it. We've warmed up our engine, all of our components are up to operating temperature, we've got good oil pressure, we're ready to go racing. Oil pressure, another example of math under pressure. Math under pressure, I would say driving under pressure also, Johnny's got to be like that. Every time I see that, I think of Hot Rod Lincoln, Commander Cody right there. That's where I'm from <laughs> way in the back in the day. Anyway, 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. By the time everybody goes on spring break at the end of this month, that will be the end of live broadcast for Do the Math this 22nd season. And uh, we certainly do appreciate all of you that view and call into the program. Jasmine is a ninth grade student at Independence High School very involved at Independence High School, and I say that that's a very good thing for you to do. But I know that you are working with uh, some complex numbers and imaginary numbers and stuff. You ready for another one? All right, let's take a look at the one we've got right now. So right now we've got negative three, as I focus it in there. There we go, negative three minus five i, all over two plus i. Jasmine, tell me something about this. This is a very, very different problem than what we did before. We're dividing. We are dividing. So we, you know that students love to say, hey, let's just get rid of those eyes, right? That would be the best thing ever. But we can't do that, unfortunately. 
How come you can't do that? You, I don't know though. There's a special word for this, but all I know is you do the opposite of the uh, what's happening. So we're right. adding two plus i. Right. So then you would multiply it with two minus i. Okay, so we've got a lot going on here. So yeah. first of all, we can't just cross these off because I like to think of this as glue, right? This negative sign is glue. It sticks the negative three and the negative five i together. <clears throat> this plus sign is glue. It sticks that together. And so what you're doing is you are trying to, it seems to me, get rid of the i's on the bottom. Why can't you have an i on the bottom of a fraction? Because we don't really, we want to find without i. Right. And we can't have an i on the bottom because then we wouldn't know what would actually That's it. be the That's full it. answer. It's kind of like having a fraction like 5 over 0, right? We don't like to have that 0 yeah. on the bottom. It's irrational. We have the same thing happening here, right? We have a complex number on the bottom. We don't want a complex number on the bottom of a fraction. Let's get rid of it. So what you've done is multiply it times something else. You're probably going to use a method like FOIL. And a lot of students will know that from algebra, right? Why did you specifically choose 2 minus i? It's this. the reciprocal. <clears throat> Conjugate. Conjugate. That's conjugate. the word but I was you're, trying you're to You're using find. your vocabulary. I like it. Reciprocal is when you take a fraction and flip it oh, over. Oh, there you go. But you are using the conjugate, right? Yeah. And that's the same uh, constant in the front. We still have the i in the back, but we change the sign. So think about back to your regular algebra days. What happens when you have a binomial times another binomial, and the only difference is a change in the sign? What happens when you FOIL that out? Multiply them. You multiply them out. But what happens? It's a very unique answer, right? So for instance, again, I want to relate this to regular algebra, and the reason is many more students will understand what's going on. When you multiply this out, right, that's actually a 2 as well. When you multiply this together, what happens to the middle terms? They cancel each other out. That's it. It's super unique, right? And mm -hmm. So what we end up with is a difference of squares, right? This is an x, promise. I'm not very good at writing x sometimes. The answer to this problem here, or the, the way you simplify it when you FOIL it out, there's no middle term. There's no x to the first power. This is great, right? We like to have this in this situation because what's going to happen is the i is going to be the second power, and we can use a chart. We're also going to have a constant, and we can put those together and only have a number on the bottom of the fraction. So the choice you made was very wise, and it is made for a very specific reason, because it will make the bottom of the fraction, the denominator, into a regular number, right? A regular mm -hmm. whole number with no i's left over. All right, let's go ahead and start to, to do that. You multiply on the bottom. What I do on the bottom, you do on the top. That's it. That's all the rule of fractions. Whatever you do on the bottom, you got to do on the top. I like it. So we got some foiling to do, right? Yeah. Which one do you want to do first, top or bottom? Top. Okay, let's do the top. Do you want me to do the bottom? Totally up to you. There's lots of different ways to do it. I like this show today because we're talking about different ways of solving the same problem. If you want to do the box, I great. just like doing regular algebra, okay. so I'll write it here. So tell us what's happening here. I'm multiplying negative 3 minus 5i mm -hmm. times 2 minus i. Okay. So first, I would focus on this negative 3. Okay. I multiply this negative 3 by this 2, yes. which would be negative 6. Good. And then the same with negative 3, but times it with the negative i. Okay. So that would now the negative and negative will make it to a positive, mm -hmm. so that would be plus 3i. Good. And now I focus on this negative 5i. Right. This we multiply to the 2, so that would be negative 10i. And this negative 5i would multiply to the negative i. Negative, negative equals a positive, so that would be plus 5i squared. Aha, we finally are at a 5i squared. I like it. Good deal. Anything you can combine in there? This. <laughs> We don't worry about the 5. <laughs> don't look at the 5. I, I squared is equal to, as look at a chart, negative 1. That's it. So really, you can take this one, right, mm -hmm. and cross it off. And we're going to basically multiply times negative 1, right? 5 times negative 1. So let me rewrite this whole thing. This Let's write it again. Negative 6 plus 3i minus 10i plus 5 times negative 1 would be negative 5. Good job. Okay, I'm going to give you a little more room right. here because it looks like you're still going. Now I Keep would on going. Hold on. Don't worry about no. that part yet. Keep on going. Oh, wait. Let's simplify. Combine like terms. Yep. Yeah. Just numbers, like we did at the beginning. Yeah, right? real numbers go in the front. Negative 6 minus 5 is negative 11. And plus 3i minus 10i is negative 7i. Good. There's nothing else that we can do. That's nothing. Okay, we're good. So 11 minus 7i. Can you put that way up here on the top? So we're going to have equals and a fraction, right? On the top part. So remember, we're on the top, right? You remember what it was? Let's look at it again. Negative 11. Negative 11 minus 7i. Good job. All right. I'm going to do the same thing to the bottom. Now. Yeah, that's right. 
What do you think? Can you squish it all right in here? Yeah. Okay, let's squish it. What we know is like what you said. When it's the same thing, but it's the conjugate, you, there's not going to be no middle term. Right. So we don't have. We just know we don't have to worry about that. So when we simplify this, you would do two times two, which is four. Right. But there's no middle term, so then you would just do. And the middle term, really, when you think about it, is plus two i minus two i. Minus two i. And so those ones are going to go away. Good job. And then you would just do your plus i times negative i would be negative i squared. I like it. But then this can const. That would be actually become a negative i. Uh huh. Negative one. Negative one. Good job. So then that would just be equals four plus one, which equals to five. All right. So now you can put that on the bottom of your main fraction there. Okay. Well, this I'll tell you what looks a lot more simple than this one over here because there's no i in the bottom. Now the next question that a lot of students would ask is, can you start dividing this five into here and five into there? Sorta. Of. I mean, you could, right? Yeah. But you would really get a mess. <laughs> You really, I mean, you could do it. There's lots of fun stuff you could do here. Yeah. But you get a pretty doggone big mess, and we probably don't want to mess with that too much today. Right, I was going to say, that's where you're going to leave it right Sure, there. yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And that's the simplest you can get, as long as you have a whole number on the bottom of this fraction. It is simplified as far as it can go. Great job. I like that work there. Yeah, nicely done. Well, right now, we're going to check out another one of the schools in the CSU system. I grew up in Oakland, just me, my parents, my sister, my cousins. We didn't have cable. We would always have PBS on. There was like, of course, Bill Nye, right? That's the OG science show. I was 19 years old and I knew some people who like were hairstylists already. So I was like, mm, let me give that a try. And I was at the salon like nine years. Getting my degree was always something that I wanted. I was just like, I wondered if I could. Have you learned how to graph linear functions in class? Yep. I'm really passionate about my education and I'm afraid to let my parents down because my parents sacrifice everything. My dad always tells us if we don't want to have a job like his job where he has to do hard labor, we really need to have an education for her to get like an office job. I don't like that he puts himself down to bring us up. His job is an honest job. And since they didn't go to school, they didn't have a chance to go to school, I kind of want to like do that for them. Both my parents didn't go to college. I didn't recognize the value of that until much later, until now, in fact. My father works in apparel. My mom uh, ran boutiques, taught me what work ethic meant. I have fond memories of my father and mom working till 2 a.m. counting how much cloth they had in the storage. I specifically listen to Christian music only in the morning. I, I make sure to start off my day like that. I wake up right out my bed, Every step I get in, I say, God taught me, and I'll make up my bed, and then I wash my face. From what I do remember at three years old, very vividly, um, a, a fight broke out with my mom and dad, and I remember my sister picking me up, carrying me upstairs. She was five years old at the time. She called 911. I remember I was in the back seat of a police car with my sister. We were at McDonald's going to the foster care facility. I believe and I trust that it was it was all in God's will and for sure it definitely grew me into who I am today. We are East Bay. I chose to go to Cal State East Bay first off because it was the most affordable choice. And on top of that, it was a lot closer to home. The fact that it was close to home and it was smaller kind of gave me comfort. I feel like East Bay is super diverse. But it has that idea of having that private community. I've definitely enjoyed that the most, that the students really actually try to interact with you. The, our physics department here is really small, but I think that's exactly what I needed. Faculty and staff is really supportive here. They really do care about your education. I'm also thankful for my professors. I'm thankful for Dr. Borjo. He's been really supportive and has always believed in me. I remember I walked into class one, one day this semester and my professor, he was like, hey, Wolfgang, right? He was like, you work at Apple, right? I was like, yeah, I, I interned at Apple. And then he was, and I was like, oh, that was pretty cool. I, he already knew who I was and I, I didn't even know his name yet, you know? CCU Space accounting program is effective. It got me into a big four at KPMG. Things that I did while I was a CSU East Bay, I was part of the board of directors of the student government. They are a mirror image of what I do today. When we sold to The Gap, 
and they accepted me to become the CFO of the company. That again communicated the confidence to myself that I can do anything. Coming into physics was like the first time in my life where there's lack of representation for me. So I was like, maybe, maybe I'll teach and just being like a black woman in physics. I just want to change kind of the, the normal for my family and kind of what we're used to. I don't want them to feel like they're stuck in this box. School is something I'm really passionate about because I really like to learn and grow myself. I feel like if I were to stop my education, I wouldn't really get to where I want to go. So I was like, doctor or researcher? I have two young daughters and I hope that they will also go to college one day and uh, have that same experience because I thoroughly enjoyed mine. Always magnificent, so generous, always be giving it a hundred percent. A fake dude, nemesis, this is the real deal. Let me show you what the business is. Watch out, flip it like Gabby, scholarly intellect, the street corner savvy. Came from the far side, still came past me. Set for Exxon, can't outgas me. <laughs> and we about to raise the bar up, wake these dudes up like two cups of Starbucks. <laughs> but really, it ain't no competition. You flies through out, it ain't no opposition. So optimistic, baby. There we go, a little bit about East Bay, another system, or another school in the CSU system. We have Jasmine, a ninth grade student from Independence Elementary, been working with complex and imaginary numbers, and now we're going to move on to something a little different. So, in describing the characteristics of a stream, a hydrologist might wish to state the percent of increase or decrease in stream flow between two points. If the flow at point A is 7 feet per second, and the flow at point B is 5 feet per second, what percent of flow is lost between A and B? So, think about what you would like to do to start. You've got Scott right there to help you out. <laughs> so let's make sure we understand the question, right? The question says, <clears throat> what percent of flow is lost? So if you could think about your percentage problems and how that works. With percentage problems, you can always use proportions, right? You can always use proportions if you want to. You don't have to. But that's one way to think about it. Uh, but when you're talking about increase or decrease, lost or gained, we're going to do a little subtraction and we're going to compare it to the original number. If you had to pick these two, one of these two numbers, which one do you think is the original number, the, the number that we start off with? Seven. Yeah, that's it. That's point A, right? Like along the stream. So here's the stream, right? There's, I've been practicing drawing streams all day. And we have point A here and we have point B here and the stream's going that way. And it's losing some flow. It's losing some speed, maybe because it goes over rocks, or maybe it gets to a little bit more calm place in the stream or something like that. So this is where we start, and that's where we end, right? So we want to know how much does it go down if it goes 7 feet to 5 feet. So just with some really simple mathematics, what have we lost between A and B? Two feet per second. Two feet per second, right? How'd you get that? That's a point A and point B. Yeah, that's right. So if you subtract these two, we have lost two feet per second, right? We've lost that much. Now, when you're talking again about increase or decrease, percent of increase or decrease, you always want to compare that to the original number. And you've already established that was A. So let's compare that, right? We're going to compare two with seven. What's the easiest way to compare something in math? And she says a fraction, right? Of course it's a fraction. <laughs> the easiest way to compare two things is, is with a fraction. We're going to make this into a percent. Can you make this fraction into a percent? Uh, yeah, you can divide both. Absolutely. Let's do that. Two divided by seven. Yeah. And of course, we're going to go a couple decimal places over, right? Yeah. Because it's not going to go evenly. But you can, go, you can do that and add seven, some zeros. Seven does not go into two. Right. So now I write zero. Mm -hmm. I have my point there. Bring the zero down here. The seven goes into 20 two times. Okay. So two times seven is 14. Subtract that. 20 <coughs> minus 14 is six. That doesn't go into seven though. So then I would bring down another zero. Mm -hmm. Now before you go any further, where's your decimal in this problem right here, or in that number? That's it. And I know you had it up here, but we want to make sure we're real clear about that. We're not really dividing seven into 200. We're dividing 7 into 2 and getting a, a decimal answer. I like it. Keep on going. You're doing great. Bring the 0. So then 7 can go into 60. 
Uh -huh. 7 times 8 is 56. Good. And let's go one more so we can at least see if we're going to round up four. or down, right? But 7 doesn't go into 4, so right. then again I'd bring down another 0. Okay. And 7 goes into 40. Uh, seven, five times. Good. Seven times five is 35. That's it. And of course, five. you can see it's going to keep going. Gonna it's keep not going to repeat, on. but it's going to keep going, right? You're going to bring it down to zero, and you're going to have some left over, and you're going to bring it down to zero and have some left over. And seven does not like to go into things evenly. No. It's just kind of the characteristics of seven. But if you had to change that decimal now into a percent, what would that be? 28.5%. That's it. And if you go round it to the nearest whole percent? 29. 29%. So that's how much we've lost, right? Mm -hmm. This is equivalent to 29%. Is it an increase or a decrease? Decrease. It's a decrease, that's right. Because of this word lost, right? We are decreasing. And I think that's what the original problem says. Yeah. said, right. how, how much are we losing? Lost, so, yeah. right? Great so job. nicely done. So I made a mistake. I said Independence Elementary, you're at Independence High School. It's okay. <laughs> That's a big difference between the two. So. A little bit. Anyway, do you uh, like art? Sometimes. Is there a particular kind of art that you like doing? <laughs> Drawing, making things, or? I like, kind of like origami a little bit. I like folding up paper to come up with like a 3D object. So you're able to do that pretty quick, huh? With a video. Oh, with a video. With well, a that's video. all right. You know what? A lot of us even would have a hard time even with a video <laughs> with to be able video. to do something like that. So right now, we're going to check out some art as a career pathway. to like tell myself is like right now it doesn't look that good but like at first it never looks good but if I just keep going and like working on it then it gets better. It's a little different to me because I usually work with pencil so it's a little more difficult for me but I'm enjoying it so far. I like it. Once you let the wheel do its thing and then you're just doing your thing alongside with it, it will work. Pottery didn't work for me at first because I was trying so hard to like work against the wheel. I always tell the students, you know, if there's a mistake to be made in life or in art, I've probably made it. And just adding slip to that isn't actually gonna seal those cracks. We have to kind of knit it together by making yeah. score marks this way. If you follow these techniques, yeah, and follow these processes, you will probably not fail in the same way I did. And they'll just say, I, I'm, I'm going to try something different. And I'll say, okay, that's, you know, that's fine. See how, see how it goes for you, explore it. You know, you might find the new way to do something. A lot of times, innovation comes from trying something differently. I've seen you kind of struggling with getting this, <laughs> these angles right and everything. And I, I guess my question is, why? Like, if, if that's not what you love doing, and maybe it is, maybe that's something you want to accomplish, but if it's not, maybe let's throw that out the window and explore more of the areas that it excites you. Experimentation and failure are a huge part of the creative process. And if you're not willing to fail, you're really not going to do anything new or exciting. And so, you know, I try to model that, and sometimes during a demo, things will fall apart in my hands, and I'll be like, you know, we'll, we'll teach, teach from there. When I first started throwing, it was very thick and clunky and like just sloppy. And he taught me like, you can do it right and it'll look so much better. He's very good at helping me realize my own ability. Like you all gotta start somewhere. And like, I would just like, do what I could, and then one day I could do what I saw other people doing, you know? Like, it's just nice to be able to come in here and like hang out for a little bit. Like, it feels more like a break than a class. Feels like I'm cheating sometimes. I'm gonna probably make this a planter. 
I know I had a really negative experience in seventh grade art. We did calligraphy for a really long time and I failed that section and literally never wanted to make art again. That teacher was probably doing a section and I just felt really discouraged by it and I just needed someone to come alongside me and help me through it. But I never want my students to feel that way. I never want someone to give up on art because they didn't like something. I try to say that a lot during my teaching. If this isn't your thing, maybe the next thing we do will be your thing because not everybody likes everything we're gonna do. He takes the ones that are hesitant to really realizing the progress that they can make and the love that they have for it and the befores and after are incredible and so when students start seeing what abilities they really have, they start opening up more and more to it and then we have students who never thought they could be creative in their life graduating with two AP classes under their belt and some even changing their minds and going into different art fields after high school. Honestly, my career has just kind of exploded. I started at International Easy Up. It's a canopy company, so I'm doing their digital marketing. And then I'm contracted with this national beverage brand and get to do all their print and digital marketing and web design, and that's been a blast. He pushed me to see light in a whole different way, pushed me to see line work instead of objects. He also really touched on a lot of art history, which I think goes overlooked, but it explains the reasons why things were done a certain way and how they were done. And so all of that was super foundational to my art career. You can make and sell your work. And as you guys are moving into AP and moving into you know, what you want to do next, um, you know, making and selling your own work is definitely something you can start doing. I want them to see that I'm excited about making things too and that I'm a creator alongside of them. And you know, if I sell a piece of art or finish something, I'll share it with them and so that they can see he's excited about art. This you know, because excitement is contagious and I really am excited. I don't have to make it up. I mean, look at these animals. They they're terrible. <laughs> I love this one too. It's so out of proportion. If you keep that positivity and then you keep pushing forward, and have that vision of end product and what I've seen in the past with students' lives being changed through art, whether it becomes their career path or just something that inspires them or that they can relate to, I think that's where the success lies. a career pathway in anything at all that you desire. So Jasmine, now that you're in high school, and it's still pretty early, have you given any thought as to what you might want to do once you're through with high school? <clears throat> I want to go to the medical field and become a doctor. Not sure which kind though, but I just know I want to go in the medical field. Okay, so you want to go into medicine. Yeah. And like humans or animals? Humans. Okay. <laughs> Young, old, doesn't matter? Doesn't matter. All right, but that's what you, for right now, that's it. Mm -hmm. Good, all right, you ready for another problem? Yep. All right, let's take a look <laughs> at it right now. So we're gonna solve for x. So we've got two x squared plus 12 equals negative 12. Solve for x, what the heck? <laughs> This one you have to do your PEMDAS backwards. Oh, okay. Now the first question is that I would have, just to make sure we've written this down correctly, 2x squared, did it say plus 12 or plus 12x? Can we double check that real it's quick? It's just 12. Okay. Because sometimes that will be uh, part of the answer, right? Like you, you can make this into a trinomial if you had them on one side, but that's not the case on this one. Okay, what are you going to do with this? <laughs> uh, I need it. So since we were doing PEMDAS backwards, we'd first look for subtraction. And we can see we can get 2x squared by itself by subtracting 12 on both sides. Okay, good. So you subtract 12 here, subtract 12 here. These cancel out, yep. so then you just have 2x squared. And negative 12, 
minus 12 is negative 24. Good. Then we look for addition, we have no addition. Okay. So when we go to division, we can see we can divide 2 on both sides. Yep. So divide by 2, divide by 2, these cancel out. That just gives you x squared. And negative 24 divided by 2 is negative 12. Then we look for multiplication. There's nothing there. Exponents we see. We do see exponents. Now see. here is the key, right? In this problem, we got to figure out how to get rid of exponents. How do you get rid of exponents? You mean the square root. Square root, okay, good deal. That'll be fun on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> square root on this side. Okay. Square root on that side. And whatever you do to one side, you got to do the other. Good for you. These cancel out, so okay. then you just have x. That's what we're shooting for. And now we have the square root of negative 12. Right. Now, when you take the square root of a number, right, sometimes I tell my students, this is how many answers we have, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about it, up at the beginning of the problem, yeah. we're going to have two answers. So is there a way you can show that? So for instance, if you had x squared equals 9, right? And you took the square root of both sides, there are two answers to this problem. What are those two answers? x equals? Plus or minus 3. Plus or minus 3. That's it. It could be positive 3. It could be negative 3. Do you have to do that here? OK, let's see that plus or minus. Where are you going to put it? First, all we're going to see, because you're divided, you're getting the square root of a negative number. OK. So first, I want to see. What numbers go into 12 are the factors, but what I learned was one factor has to be a perfect square. Okay. So what I know is 4 times 3 is 12. Right. But I know 4 is, four, the square root of 4 is also a perfect square. Okay. So you're saying we want to do 4 times negative 3, kind of like that, right? Yeah. Because um, we still have a negative in there. Can I show you? What Absolutely. Go for it. Times a negative 1. Oh, so you've even broken it up even further. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like it. So then the square root of 4 is plus or minus 2. So then you're at, right now it would be plus or minus 2. Okay. You have, you're multiplying it by the square root of 3, but 3 is not, you don't have a perfect square. Right. So then you keep that there. But first I see the negative 1, the square root <laughs> of negative 1. And looking at my chart, I remember I equals the square root of negative 1. Okay. So what I know is I to the first power is I. Right. But i also equals the square root of negative 1. So that I can, instead of that, I can write i. But i has to go in front of the square root. So right now it's plus or minus 2 times i times the square root of 3. Gotcha. So you switch places with this, right? Yeah. The square root of negative 1, this is where the i comes into place. This is why someone created it. This is mm -hmm. the whole purpose of it, right? It becomes this imaginary number that we don't even know what it is. But the definition of it is the square root of negative 1. It goes in front. Jasmine, what have you created? That is the most <laughs> complicated answer I've ever seen. Tell us a little bit about it. I think that what you've done is correct. I don't think I'd do anything different. But again, we have something here that looks kind of bizarre. Can you explain what's happening? How many answers do we have here? Because we've got a lot of different components. Two answers. Two answers. OK, what are the two answers? Can you split them into two yeah. so we can see what they actually are? Those are arrows, I promise. The first answer is that x equals plus 2 times i to the square root of 3. And then your second answer is x equals minus 2 times i to the square root of 3. There you go. So that's how you split them up into the 2, right? Because you have the positive and negative on the front. I like it. Yeah, nicely done. And I'm, nice, I'm glad how you took that square root of negative i and just flipped it to use it the other way. So you got your little clues up there and stuff like that. So nicely done. You feel pretty good about that? Yep. All right. Right now, we're going to take a look at what's going on this week at NASA. An historic delivery to the moon's south pole, a record-breaking scientific balloon flight, and an asteroid mission's close pass of the sun. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. For the first time in more than 50 years, new NASA science instruments and technology demonstrations have been operated on the moon. A suite of six science instruments and tech demos was delivered to the South Pole region of the moon on February 22nd by Intuitive Machines Odysseus Lander. The mission, known as IM-1, was the first successful delivery for the agency's Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLIPS initiative and Artemis campaign. The Gusto Scientific Balloon Mission is the new record holder for longest flight of any NASA heavy lift, long duration scientific balloon mission. It recently surpassed the previous record of 55 days, 1 hour, and 34 minutes 
while flying high above Antarctica. GUSTO is an astrophysics mission that is mapping a large part of the Milky Way galaxy, including the galactic center and the nearby Large Magellanic Cloud. Preliminary telemetry indicates that our OSIRIS Apex spacecraft, formerly known as OSIRIS REx, recently completed an operation that brought it 25 million miles closer to the Sun than it was designed to function. The close pass of the Sun, or perihelion, was the first of seven the spacecraft will make on its journey to study asteroid Apophis, which is expected to have a rare close encounter with Earth in April 2029. The recent Carpet Determination in Entirety Measurements, or Carpet DM tests, were aimed at helping researchers examine the quality and ruggedness of a new generation of ground recording systems. The recording equipment is needed for future flight tests of our experimental X-59 aircraft to confirm that it can fly supersonic while producing just a quiet sonic thump. The X-59 is not yet flying, so an F-15 and an F-18 aircraft were used to make supersonic passes for the recording equipment. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more about what else we're up to, check out nasa.gov. All right, that X-59 is going to be pretty happening when that thing comes out. It's supposed to make only a little thump like the sound of a basketball or a car door closing instead of the big booms that happen right now, uh, which is why you do not hear those anymore when they go over land because they're not permitted over land right now. Anyway, Jasmine, a ninth grade student at Independence High School, a falcon. And uh, I'm glad that you're very involved in school because I think that's an important part of high school and old schooling is to be involved with where you're going and uh, be part of a lot of different communities in that major community right there. So, and I'm especially glad that you uh, said that you were thinking today, right? You, we got you thinking and stuff like that. And I'm glad you brought in some complex numbers, imaginary numbers to get Scott thinking a little bit today also, all right? So you are now an ambassador for Do The Math because you are thinking. You know what an ambassador has to do? Think. Yeah, think, they do have to think, right? And you're already doing that. But you know what one of their roles is? No. They need to tell other people about things. Oh, so yeah. if you're an ambassador for Do The Math, what do you have to do? Tell people about Do The Math. You have to tell people about Do The Math. And you know what will help you tell people about Do The Math easier? Wearing a shirt. Having a uniform. Not just any <laughs> shirt. We call it a uniform here. No, I'm only kidding. But why don't you go ahead and show that over there to uh, camera three. So that is your uniform for being an ambassador for Do The Math. So all you have to do is when you have that on, people are going to go, hey, what's going on with this uh, Do The Math thing? And then you can tell them all about the program, right? Mm -hmm. And you can tell them that we make them what? Do math. Right. And do what while they're doing math? Think. Think. There you go right there. So I know that you did a lot of great work today. Uh, did you learn a little something today? Yeah. Scott taught me a trick with the, when dividing is that there's three ways you can write it. Instead of simplifying it more, we can keep it a bit more clean. Good. Well, I'm glad you learned a little something today because that's one of the main goals. But our biggest goal is did you have fun today? Yes. That was the most important thing right there. Well, Jasmine, thanks for coming in. And until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.